morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure. What an honor to be with you today. We're together in spirit. We're together um, as a family, worshiping, praying, um, loving each other. And it's so good to be with you virtually today. Please join us in a prayer of praise and worship. Thank you. The scripture today is from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more.
Good morning, church. Indeed, it is my joy to be standing before you this Sunday to offer a word to you on behalf of our God. Before I go to that, the, before we enter into the message this morning, I, I do want to say what a pleasure it was to see those videos, those pictures of, of uh, Nora and Theo and this sense of wanting to be a Christian, because indeed that is what we desire to be. And I'm very thankful that this was the song that was chosen uh, this day for us to sing. So will you go to the throne of grace with me as we enter in a moment of prayer? Holy God, as I come to stay in this house, I ask, oh God, that you lift me up on your wings, oh God, and let the very words I speak and the very moves I take be those, oh God, that uplift the message you have, not only for your people, but for me as well, oh Lord. Come into this house, come into each of our homes, oh God, and let the Holy Spirit flow. Let the power come through. Let us hear a word that is particular for us, for our way, for our being, for our movement. So God, this day, come. Come, Holy One, into the words that are on my lips and that have come from my heart. I ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom I pray. Amen. If you might be challenged this morning, if you might be challenged this morning on this theme, the church needs a reformation. The church needs a reformation. Reformation is not something that is very common in the Baptist tradition, not in the sense of when we go back to 1517, when Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis, in which he, he questioned and challenged the church over its selling of indulgences. Indeed, he was challenging the church because it was written on his heart that something different ought to be done, that a new way ought to be made, that instead of using your power and authority, that the church itself might sustain itself, might grow and, and become a financial uh, being, it would be something that he would challenge them and say, no, the church is, is more than this, and we ought to do it differently. This is wrong. And so he challenged the church on that great period in 1517. He challenged the church so much so that he would actually end up being kicked out the church. He would be left outside. But instead, because I believe as the words of Jeremiah, because the words of God were written on his heart, not, not on a plaque somewhere, uh, not, not in the list of expectations within the church, but it was written in his heart. He could do no other. He could not stand and let this continue on and on when he saw that people were hurting, when he saw that people were struggling. No, he, he, he called out the wrong and the injustice that the very church that he was claiming was doing in the land. Indeed, in 1517, the church needed a reformation. But I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that the church still needs a reformation. We still need to make changes in the way we do and the way we are in ways that, that are going to challenge us, that are challenging us. In the past 75 years, the church has been, has been impacted more by the changes on the outside of the church than we have within. Indeed, what has affected our litany, what has affected our pedagogy, what has affected our theology, what has affected our church more is what's been happening outside the church over the last 75 years. Think back to the civil rights movement and the change it has brought about in us. Think about the women's movement and the change that it has brought about in the past 75 years in the church. Think about what has happened in our LGBTQI community and how it has changed the church. In fact, it was quite amazing this week knowing that this sermon was coming. It was quite amazing to hear the Pope of the Catholic Church saying that there ought to be some newness, some reformation, a reformation around civil unions among same-sex couples, high Jesus. And yet many of our congregations 
across the board are still struggling with that sense of inclusion rather than looking at exclusion. And that's where we still are. The church needs a reformation today. No, we don't have it all together. We don't have it all fixed. In fact, we're still being impacted. We're still being reformed by what is happening outside the church more so than what's going inside the pews, inside of our homes, inside of our very lives. And I believe this passage this passage is a reminder to us that God has written it on our hearts. God has not put someone up there. God has written it on our very hearts, how we ought to live and how we ought to be. And yet, my friends, we still struggle to go there. We still struggle to get there. Our world today has, has gone through a tremendous change just in this past year alone. In this past year alone, Black Lives Matter has changed the whole landscape. In this, in this time alone, we've been dealing with the rapidly changing uh, issues around immigration outside of our church. We have been dealing even more so with COVID-19. In fact, my friends, we are going through such dramatic changes that look how we're doing worship today. Would we have ever done worship this way had it not been COVID-19 in our path? Would we be looking at new models or would we still say, well, we need to come and sit in the church on Sunday morning. We need to be in the pews. And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that. I miss y'all and I, I would love to have you sitting right here with me. But yet in this time and in this place, we are doing a new thing. And the question is, is what other things are we ought to be reforming and we ought to be looking at? And more importantly, when this COVID-19 has passed, will we come back to wanting to do worship the exact same way that we've always done it? Or will we look at the sense of saying, wait a minute, there's something new going on. There's a new medium to reach out to people. There is a new way that we can be Christ in the world. That will be the sense of, of reformation that we're being asked to make. And why? Why can we even do this? We can do it because for those of us who love the Lord, who heard our cry, who pitied every groan, it is written on our hearts. It was never this building. It was never the building you're in. It was always the word of God that is written and included inside of you. When Jeremiah speaks these words to, to, to the people of Israel, to the Israelites, to those folks in that time, he was letting them know that there was a new thing going on. More importantly, what I love about this is that who initiates this newness? God. It is God who writes this on their hearts. And it is God who writes it on our heart. And right now, the church itself needs to reform because what is going on outside the world is constantly changing. And we are 15, 20, 30, 100 steps behind. Yes, my brothers and sisters, the church needs a reformation in its pews. The church needs a reformation in its pulpits. The church needs a, re a reformation in its and its way of doing mission and missional ministry. Yes, we need a reformation because the same old way we used to do things are no longer. I was thinking this morning, for the longest time, we've been offering this, this homeless ministry from our church. And we've been offering this, this homeless ministry where folks would come in once a week and get a shower and, and, and or, or as often as they wanted to during the week. We would do it three days a week and we provide meals for them. Well, that ministry has been shut down right now. And the question I'm asking is, what are we going to do next? How are we going to reform this ministry into something different, but new, but still offering that sense of reaching out and touching the very persons that are needed, that are homeless, that are not getting a meal every day? How are we going to look at this ministry differently? That is the question for us. It's not a sense of saying, well, we'll just wait. And we'll just see what happens six months from now or a year from now. The question is, how are we being creative right now and thinking how that ministry might go on? Yes, the church needs to be looking at how it can reformate itself into being the Christ in the world that we are called to be. How can we be actively engaged in what is going on around our world? Because it is so easy as it was in times past 
It's so easy to write a check or send a, send a donation. But I'm telling you right now, this reformation has been going on and we've been behind the, the, the we've been behind the wagon for a long time. We weren't in the wagon, which if we, even if we would just get in the wagon, in essence, if we just got on the bus, that might be good. But we're way behind the bus. How are we looking at how we do our ministry? My friends, you and I, if we wanted to watch a movie right now, we would not go back and get a 16 millimeter camera. We would not try to pull out the old VCR. No, we would not. Matter of fact, right now, I, many of us, many of you who will see this, how are you, how are you getting your news? How are you getting your information? How are you watching your movies? Well, it's YouTube, it's it's Hulu and Netflix. So we we have now come into a new world and a new place, and we've accepted that. So then how are we as a church, how are we going to reformate ourselves to be the very church we need to be in the world? And Martin Luther wrote that thesis and pinned it on the wall. It wasn't a matter of what would befall him. It wasn't a matter that, that folks would go along with him. He knew the sacrifice he was going to make. But because it was written on his heart, he could do no other and sisters and brothers, as a church, as a church, we cannot sit still, even though all of this stuff is going on. We cannot be silent. We cannot be inactive. We cannot be prepared to make changes. We're getting ready to have an, an election, an election for, for officers and leaders of this nation. And indeed, there needs to be a reformation in how that process is done. We've just gotten through a, a, an appointment of a Supreme Court uh, uh, judge that, that many question, and yet the system allows it to be. The question is, is how are we going to reformate this system, not only in the church, but also join that reformation that's happening out in the world? There is a vote coming up around a fair tax. What is that fair tax? That fair tax is so that so that those who, who make less will pay less. And the question is, is how will we help be a positive influence on how that change occurs? How will we be looking out for our brothers and sisters? My, my, my friends, I'm saying this to our siblings and our friends. We do need to, as a church, yes, the church needs to reform there was a time when guitars and drums would never be seen, and some of us are still holding on to that premise, but indeed, the church has changed. There was a time when, when going out and doing missional ministry was a big thing, but that has changed. How we will do the work moving ahead, we are being challenged because God has written it on our hearts that we are to be the very change we hope to see, and it does mean, my friends, something new. It does mean that God is trying to initiate something in you and me. And yes, the church from 1517 had seen reformations before that. The church after 1517 would see reformations after that. And my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that we need to reform too. We need to be reformed from who we've been. Yes, we're not in the 50s and 40s and 60s when folks flock to the church. No, that's not the way it is right now. In fact, in fact, right now, what is where people are coming to church is through the mediums in which we're using right now. More folks are paying attention. More folks are looking. They're not coming to sit necessarily in the pews. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But how are we going to reformate ourselves as the church today? Preachers and teachers and, 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 and directors in our churches are asking the same question. And I hope willing to go in in depth with that. But yes, if we sit and we think that church is going to always be what it's always been, we're, 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 we're fooling ourselves, brothers and sisters. In fact, the church has never always been what it's always been. There have been those of us who tried to hold on to it for dear life, like it's the, it's the only thing to do. Change is, is hard. But I'm telling you, reformation is not because it comes from the very heart of God in you and in me. 
They come from our very heart that we would see that we need to make a difference in the world and the way we're doing it may not be that impactful anymore. So what are we going to do? How are we gonna stand up for justice in the world? How are we gonna stand up for peace in the world? How are we gonna bring about a sense of solidarity among our brothers and sisters? How are we gonna stand up today in a changed world with our LGBTQI community? How are we gonna stand up with Black Lives Matter? How are we gonna engage this work even though right now, yes, we got COVID, and, I, and that, that can become a piece of saying, well, I can't, I can't do anything, and that's not true. You got a phone? <laughs> you got a mouth? <laughs> oh, you can do something. You got a hand you can write with, a computer you can type on. You can be making a difference, my brothers and sisters. You can stand up and say that we need to change the way we have been doing things because they do not work anymore. Yes. When Luther did this, he took a risk. You and I are being asked today to take risk, to accept the challenge that the church does need to reform, that the church does need to change. Now, I wanna be clear. I'm not saying you throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we need to look at ourselves intently and we need to say, what it is, what is it? What difference are we making in the way we're going about this thing called ministry? How are we impacting the lonely and the lost, the least, the unwanted? How are we impacting the immigrants who are stuck in detention centers? How are we impacting right now those who are sitting in prison cells and prison walls? How, how are we impacting those who need mental health and, and are, have no services available for them? How are we going to use the power of our vote to make a difference? No, we can't guarantee anything. We talked about this a week ago because that comes from God. But God says in his word through Jeremiah that it is written on their hearts. My brothers and sisters, as claimers of the church, as people of the pews, we need to make sure that we accept the change God is asking us to make. Because I want to point this out to you. The choice to make a change, the reform, for reformation to happen is yours. It's ours. If Luther had just decided to just keep this to himself, if he just decided to say, you know what? Uh, I'll write this down and I'll put it and follow it in the drawer over here. I won't do anything with it. That would have been just as, that would have been the easy way out. And that's the question for you and me. When we have a sense of ideology and thought, when we have a sense of how our pedagogy, our litany, how our theolo theology ought to change, the question is, is will we? How long did it take the Catholic Church to even have a word about LGBTQI? It took a long time, my sisters and brothers, but it's here. And they will wrestle with that just as we wrestle with it in our own denominations across the board, across the land. And there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done on how we wrestle with how we are going to support those who are in poverty, those who are hungry, those who are naked, those who have no homes. It's still a question. The point is, is what are we doing to reform our very system that we might not take a step back? We're not lost in committee because, you know, churches, <laughs> have mercy, Jesus. We can get lost in committee so quickly and things never change. They stay the same as they always been. But God has a word for you and me. God has a word for God's church. That reformation is part of who he is, who she is, who the spirit is. Indeed, God is saying, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And I'm asking you as the church that it's time. It's been time. It's still time that you and I are called to reform, to change. And the church... <laughs> I believe, I believe in the scripture, it says that, that, the, that God says, I was, I was your husband. Indeed, God is saying, I'm actively engaged with you. This is not something you're doing alone. You're going to make some mistakes. We are going to make some mistakes. We are going to fall down. But I'm telling you right now, we can get back up again. Yes, my brothers and sisters, our church North Shore Baptist Church needs a reformation. Don't, don't, don't get complacent. Don't, don't assume that we got it all together. We may do some good things, but my brothers and sisters, God ain't finished with us yet. 
and there's still work for us to do. And there's work for us to do with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and our friends, our siblings, everyone. It is a, still a call for you and me. We can't go back to the way things used to be. Times, I, I believe times keep on changing. As a Bob Dylan would say. And so here we are. Here we are in this October 2020. And the word reformation, which we may not claim as much as we ought, is the word that God has on my heart for you and for me and for our church and for the world today. Because we need it. And God will initiate if we will only be willing to listen and to move forward. If we'll only be willing to take the risk that, that Martin Luther would take in 1517. In 2020, we're being asked to take the risk. And it may seem hard. It may feel difficult. But we as the church are called to be risk takers. We are called as a church to stand up to the challenges of the world today, not sit inside of our confines of our structures, but to go out into the world in whatever means, whatever way that we can, and be the difference makers that the world needs. God is not done. And God is calling on the church to be the church, to be a community that loves and shows compassion and offers grace and offers all of those things. And so you and I may only be able, may, may be able to do that today through the vote we will take soon. We, we may be able to do it today by a letter we might write to a politician. We, we, might, we might be able to do it by, by just reaching on the phone and calling someone and, and telling them what we think about them and it's just to say we love them and, and we're sorry they're going through the struggle, struggles that they are going through. We, 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 we might do it simply by sending someone a dinner because it's their birthday. Yes, we are called to do things differently this day. And the challenge for the church, every church, every house of worship, every place where God is claimed, everywhere, whether it's in the Islamic, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Islam, Islam, whether it's in, in Hindu, whether it's in uh, the the uh, Jewish, whether it is Baptist, whether it is Presbyterian, whether it is whatever faith tradition it may be, we're being called today to do this thing because there needs to be a reformation so that the world might be changed. Not just you, but the world might be changed. I better stop because I feel like going on and, and y'all know I'm getting warm up in here and the heat ain't even on. So I'm going to say right now, that may God bless you and may this day be a day that you take home that our church, not somebody else's, I want to be clear, I'm not, I don't, that our church needs a reformation because God is calling us into this world to do the very new thing that will let others know who God is for them. It's not about them being in this building, by the way. It's about them experiencing the love, grace, and mercy of God. And God will do the rest. Amen. It is now time for us to attend to the changes in our hearts, in our lives in this past week to lift up together and celebrate. Um, the joys and to also share together the pains and the concerns. Um, so I would invite you now to um, share out loud uh, what you would like prayer for. And um, if you are following on Facebook, I also am watching that feed. So feel free to share on Facebook as well. What do we have to share with one another? Just so everyone knows, you're now free to unmute yourselves. Um, I would like to uh, share prayers or ask for prayers of celebration. My husband's birthday is today, Leo, who's also a brother and brother-in-law and uncle here uh, in this uh, 
in this community. So um, prayers for Leo today. Prayers for Leo as we celebrate him, his life, another year, and all that he brings to the world around him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I would like prayers for my uh, uh, friend in New York, Lynn, who I spoke to earlier this week, uh, who uh, has gone into hospice care uh, with cancer, and uh, we are we were pretty close, and so I'm praying for him and ask uh, that we would lift Lynn up in prayer. Prayers for Lynn as he enters hospice and faces this very sacred time of transition, and prayers for all who love him, all who are walking with him, and the transition that they are facing, that they may feel accompanied by God and by the beloved community in this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our you prayer. prayer. I'd also okay. like prayers for uh, a couple of friends of mine who, uh, frankly, they're near death. Uh, we were told uh, this past week by their families. So I'd like to have prayers said for the families, especially they're, they're both struggling. Prayers for your friends who are also facing the transition of death and for the families who are walking with them and all of the emotions and the struggles that go with that transition for a whole family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayers. I would like to pray for those who are homeless, displaced, that they may find shelter. Prayers for our neighbors who live on the street, who are displaced or otherwise estranged um, without a sense of home, that they may find shelter, that they may find safety, that they may find what they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I'd like us to pray for, <clears throat> excuse me, for every polling place in our nation, that it be a place of safety where people can express their desire for their leadership and not, um, you know, not encounter any danger or any um, harm and that um, they have access to the voting that they deserve. Prayers for our nation as we continue in this time of election, this time of voting. I pray that everyone may feel safe physically, um, emotionally as they vote in whatever way um, they vote that, as you say, that they may be free uh, to express their opinion and have their voice heard without intimidation, without suppression. And prayers for all those who are working the polls, all of us who will be working the polls on November 3rd, that we might also be kept safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So we have a praise and a prayer. Um, praise because we got hitched and that's exciting. It was a, a great way to celebrate, you know, the blessing that God has given us in each other. By hitch, she means married. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the, the prayer that I would ask for is for those who are kind of feeling like they're standing on a precipice, like things have changed and they're looking for the hope, they're looking for the light, they're looking for the things to sustain them despite, you know, the fear of the world around us, the financial concerns, the, you know, there's so many people who are, <laughs> thanks, thanks Sherry. <laughs> um, so many people who are looking at dra drastic changes in their lives and wondering, how do they keep moving forward when the future is so uncertain? So just prayers for them. Prayers of thanksgiving for the two of you and all that you bring to this church and to the world around you and prayers for you as you continue on your journey uh, side by side. And um, prayers for those who are on the edge of the cliff in this time, emotionally, financially, however that may be that um, a safety net might be extended 
that our community might be able to support them. And for you, as you both minister to people in that situation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask for continued prayers for my friend Linda and her partner Sharon, um, for Sharon especially that she is pain-free and comfortable. For Linda and Sharon in this time and for Sharon um, that she may be without pain and in comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. If we have nothing else to share out loud, I would invite us all to open our hearts to the spirit and to one another and go to God in prayer. Holy one, holy love, holy tenderness, holy spirit of solidarity, flow within us, between us, knit our lives and our hearts together across the distance. God, we attend in this moment to those among us who are dying, who are facing that great and sacred transition and for all of those who love them. God, we know that dying is one of the most important and powerful things that we do, but it is scary and it is difficult and it is so deeply unknown in so many ways. Be with those who are walking that journey and those who are walking it with them, that they may not feel alone, but feel accompanied even in the fear of the mystery and the anguish of losing one that is loved. God, I pray for those who are facing tumult and torment in these times of political upheaval, economic upheaval, the upheaval of health in this time of pandemic. I pray for those who are experiencing their lives this moment as if on the edge of a cliff that they could fall off at any moment. I pray that you may pull them back, God, that you may send your people, send us your hands and feet to pull them back from the edge, to surround them in safety, in a blanket, in a net, to protect them from falling, that they may know that they are not alone, that they are held, God. And may it be so, may they be held. For those who are living on the street in this time, God, may they too be held in love and held in safety and in a sense of home, even if it's not a brick and mortar building. God, I pray for peace for all of us, in this time of voting, in this time of election, God, may it be a time in which that beautiful and sacred conscience that you have placed in each of us may find room to be expressed in peace and in safety, without hostility, without interpretation. For as our ancestor in the faith, Roger Williams, guides us and teaches us, the conscience is sacred and yet so vulnerable and that conscience is from you. God, may we be guardians of the conscience for ourselves and for all of our neighbors and siblings. And as we close this time of prayer, as we continue together in one spirit, we echo the words that have reverberated through the centuries to us from our Lord, from the cornerstone of our faith that is Christ with the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
sisters and brothers, this place, each of our places, has been made by God and is a sacrament to God. May you and I join God's call for reformation in the church, for reformation in our lives, for reformation in God's world. Go in the peace, grace, love, and mercy of the Holy One. Amen.